May of 1896 was a special time in Persia. As the Persian New Year passed, people shed their winter cloaks and embraced the luscious Middle Eastern spring. Nature had bestowed its blessing on the land, and the earth was a canvas of natural wonders that radiated a renewed vibrance with each passing day. But this particular spring was unique for a few different reasons. In May of 1896, the Kingdom of Persia was preparing itself to celebrate the Golden Jubilee of Nasser al-Din Shah's reign in the Qajar dynasty. The 50-year rule of the king had been a consequential period for the region. He had tried to bring aspects of 19th century modernity to the country, but at the cost of losing many concessions to the Russian and British governments. Yet, none of this was going to stop Nasser al-Din from the majestic celebration of his 50-year tenure as Persia's king and his overseeing of one of the world's greatest empires. At least, that's what he believed. In the following months, as the country was getting closer to the special date, the government employees busily adorned official buildings with elegant decor. The streets and bazaars, too, were not forgotten, for city workers skillfully embellished them with alluring ornaments. Even in foreign lands, Iran's ambassadors toiled to spread the word of the 50-year reign of their king. Before the official start of the celebration, Nasser al-Din Shah wanted to do his religious pilgrimage to the mosque of a descendant of Shiite imams who were buried in a city close to Tehran. The protocol for these types of visits were that the religious site would be closed to the public and the Shah and his entourage would have a private visit and pay their respects. But with the celebrations looming, Iran's Shah decided to do a public visit. Nasser al-Din Shah wanted to be amongst his people, He wanted the nation to see that even after 50 years of ruling, Iran's Shah was still a down-to-earth guy. On Friday, May 1st, Nasser al-Din Shah entered the Abdalazim Mosque and started approaching the main shrine. But, just as he was about to pay his respects and do his prayers, a man appeared in front of him, took out a gun from under his robe, and shot the Persian king right through the heart. As Nasser al-Din Shah's entourage rushed to find the person responsible, waves of people ran and scattered in panic. Amidst the pandemonium, blood flew on the mosque's floor and the Qajar's longest reigning monarch lay dead on the ground. Hi, my name is Oriana, and you're listening to The Lion and the Sun, a modern history of Iran. The person responsible for Nasser al-Din Shah's assassination was Mirza Reza Kermani, or as he was later known, Reza the Kingslayer. He was neither a political rival, an heir to the throne, nor did he have a personal grudge against the king. He was a peasant who was constantly pressured by the local rulers of Tehran and frustrated with the living conditions of his country. After the tobacco protests, Nasser Altin Shah had no choice but to revoke the tobacco concessions given to the British. This breach of contract led to Iran having to pay over £600,000 to the Western Empire in damages. The Qajar dynasty didn't have the funds necessary to pay the fine, so the king had to take out a loan from the Imperial Bank of Persia, which was controlled by the British themselves. During this time, the price of silver was also dropping in the global market, which led to the devaluation of Kron, Persia's then currency. The devaluation caused inflation across the country and decreased the tax revenue of the government, which in turn bankrupted the government. Yet, despite the financial troubles, Nasser al-Din Shah wouldn't budge on his luxurious lifestyle and his lavish trips across Europe. He believed that this travel was essential for familiarizing him, and therefore Persia, with the modern world. However, in reality, the trips were just incurring expensive costs that the government couldn't afford, while the ordinary people suffered. Facing these pressures and the constant abuse by the local rulers, Mirza Reza Kermani tried to submit a complaint against the people in charge and ask for leniency from the government. Instead, he went to prison for his discretions, and there he developed a hate for the entire ruling of the country. He thought that by killing Nasser al-Din Shah, 
he was taking out the root of this rotten tree and the death of the king would result in the collapse of the monarchy. But the death of Nasser al-Din Shah only made things worse for Iranians. After the assassination, those close to the Shah tried to keep the news a secret. They took Nasser al-Din Shah's body to Tehran and announced that he's only been wounded after an attack on the mosque. Despite the precautions, People feared the worst and started looting the markets for bread and fruit. The ruler of Tehran announced martial law and with the help of the army kept control of the city. Uncertain of how long this forced calm would last, the Qajar court started the process of transferring power by announcing the death of the king to his heir, Mosafar Khan. Mosafar was the fifth son of Nasser al-Din Shah. However, the early death of the three eldest and the questionable heritage of the fourth child made him the apparent heir to the Persian throne. Mozafar was content with the way things were being handled under the rule of his father. So he settled into the role of the king without much change and kept everything the way it was. Just like his father, Mozafar al-Din Shah was a big fan of traveling and wanted to visit Europe. But with the court on the brink of bankruptcy, he didn't have many funds to do so. That's why, in March of 1900, he turned to the Russian Empire and asked for a million pound loan to finance his voyage into the West, and in 1902, asked for another two million for his second trip. To make up for this deficit, the king hired Joseph Naus from Belgium to head Iran's Customs and Tariffs Department. Although Naus was successful in raising Iran's customs revenue from £200,000 in 1898 to £600,000 in 1904, the income was nothing compared to the debt Persia owned to the foreign governments. However, debt wasn't the only issue Qajars had to worry about. In 1904, after a surprise attack on the Russian Pacific fleet at Port Arthur, Russia entered into war with Japan and the trade routes on the northern side of Iran were brought to a halt. This led to a significant increase in food prices, with a 33% increase in sugar prices and a 90% increase in wheat. And if the economical crisis wasn't bad enough, in 1905, Persia and its capital city of Tehran were hit with a severe case of cholera. People were dying by the thousands, and most people were escaping the affected cities for the safety of themselves and their families. All of this pushed Persia towards its biggest societal change in centuries. In the early 19th century, with the expansion of trade between Persia and the world, wealthy and elite Persians started visiting Europe, studying there, and getting influenced by the way things were done in the West. They witnessed the parliament system in place in the United Kingdom, how educational institutions and universities cultivated knowledge, and how newspapers made sure that the public were aware of the latest developments in their countries. This led to the creation of Persia's first university called Dar al-Fanun in 1851, and the publication of the first Iranian newspaper in 1837. These significant milestones marked what many historians now refer to as the Persian Awakening. The Persians saw how the great powers were changing. The British had their own parliament since the 15th century, the French went through their revolution in the 18th century, and even the Ottomans established their very limited General Assembly in 1876. The world was advancing in social and political aspects, and their own country stagnated when it came to reforms and progression. The tobacco protest was the first instance where people came together to fight for a united cause. After its limited success, it was only a matter of time before they demanded something far more substantial from the monarchy that had taken them hostage for the past century. And on December 12, 1905, the perfect opportunity presented itself. With the Russo-Japanese War hurting the trade and Iran's mounting debt to Britain and Russia, inflation spread rapidly across the country. This led to a significant increase in the price of sugar, prompting the ruler of Tehran to lash out at two sugar merchants in the city for the crime of price gouging. 
the merchants were tied up to a pole and had their feet whipped as punishment. This punishment was called falak or bastinado and was a common type of disciplining for the guilty people in old Persia. These merchants were two of the most well-known traders of the capital. One of them, aged 79, had built three mosques in the city and even repaired the bazaar out of his own pocket after some damages. When the news of this act reached other merchants and people of bazaar, they got furious and shut down their stores and businesses the day after. The angry merchants went to the mosque Nasser al-Din Shah was assassinated in and announced their strike. They were planning on staying there until their three demands were met. Their demands were the dismissal of Tehran's ruler, the firing of Joseph Naus as the head of customs, and the establishment of a house of justice. Initially, the government stood against the changes. They even tried to break the strikes and force the merchants back to work. But Muhammad Ali Mirza, the potential heir to Mozaffar, who had grievances with his father's grand vizier, wanted to establish his place as the true heir. So, he secretly supported these protests, and with his help, the Qajar court finally gave in to the three demands. The merchants returned to the capital to roaring chants of long live the people of Iran, and Mosafar dismissed the ruler of Tehran. The king also ordered the establishment of the House of Justice, but the firing of Joseph Naus was postponed to a later date. One year after the protests, Mosafar was still unable to cut ties with Naus. Iran's customs revenue was too dependent on him and the country was still under a lot of debt. Furthermore, despite his royal decree, there had been no development in the proposed House of Justice and people were running out of patience again. The religious month of Muharram held special significance for Shiite Muslims. It marks the anniversary of the Battle of Karbala, a tragic event that occurred in 680 AC. This battle was fought between the supporters of Umayyad Caliph Yazid and the followers of Hussein ibn Ali, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. As mentioned in the previous episode, after the death of the Prophet, there had been a divide between those who follow Ali and those who pledged to Abu Bakr. Eventually, Ali accepted Abu Bakr as the caliphate and retired from public life. Following Abu Bakr's death, Umar and Usman were elected as his successors, but Usman's reign was cut short after he was assassinated in 656. This led to a period of political instability, with various factions vying for control of the caliphate. The political instability eventually calmed when the Muslim community finally granted Ali the opportunity to become the fourth caliphate of the Islamic State. Ali's election as the caliphate was a controversial ordeal. The people close to Usman, the previous caliphate, wanted Ali to prosecute those responsible for his assassination. But after his refusal, a Muslim civil war started between the two branches, with Muwave, one of Usman's closest allies, leading a rebellion against Ali's state. In 660, Ali was assassinated and his followers picked his firstborn, Hassan as his replacement. Hassan, wanting to prevent further wars within the Muslim community, wrested his claims to the caliphate and signed a peace treaty with Muawe. In the treaty, it was agreed that after Muawe, the Muslims would have a chance to elect another member as their caliphate and that Muawe would stop persecuting Ali's descendants and supporters. Initially, Muawe agreed with the treaty, but years later, he selected his son, Yazid, as his heir and the next caliphate of the Islamic State, contradicting his agreement with Hassan. After Hassan's passing in 670, Hussein, his younger brother, picked up the mantle. In 680, Yazid, who had inherited the caliphate from his father, sent him a letter asking for his allegiance. Hossein refused this request and in the month of Muharram in 681, along with his family and followers, went on a journey to Kufa, Iraq, to claim his right to the caliphate. Along the way, Hossein and his followers camped in the Karbala region and there they faced the army of Yazid. Hossein and his followers, who numbered around 72, 
were surrounded and outnumbered by the Yazid army of around 4,000 men. They were denied water and food and were eventually killed in a battle that lasted for several days. The Battle of Karbala is considered a turning point in the history of Islam and led to the split of the Muslim community into the majority Sunni and the minority Shia sects. Shia Muslims, in particular, commemorate the event of Karbala during the month of Muharram through mourning rituals such as self-flagellation, speeches, and processions. For Shiites, Hussein is a martyr and a symbol of resistance against oppression and injustice. His sacrifice is seen as an important reminder of the importance of standing up for what is right and the sacrifice of those who fought for the cause of justice. That's why the month of Muharram is usually associated with political activism and standing up against tyranny. In July 1906, during Muharram, the Qajar government arrested a preacher who had been delivering speeches against the ruling dynasty. In response, a group of religious students demanded his release, but their protests turned violent, resulting in the death of one of the students. In the aftermath, the other students took the students' blood-stained clothing and displayed it in the streets, further inflaming public anger. The following day, people from various sectors of society, including bazaar merchants, clergy members, and other businesses, gathered for the funeral and burial of the deceased. But the government, fearing the large crowd, intervened and the head of Tehran's security ordered his troops to start shooting at the mourners. There aren't any exact numbers, but according to different resources, between 23 to 100 people died that day, and hundreds of people were wounded. This event, combined with Shah's ineptitude to remove Joseph Naus and his failure in constructing the House of Justice, led to the third wave of protests against the monarchy. The prominent religious figures of the capital, including Syed Abdullah Bebahani, in an act of defiance and protest, left the city and went to Qom. They wrote a harsh criticism to the Shah, announcing that they would not return to the city unless he conformed to their demands. Bey Bahani was a prominent Shiite clergy during his time and a significant figure in Iranian politics. One of his first notable acts was rejecting Shirazi's fatwa that banned tobacco use. Bey Bahani believed that the agreement with the British would benefit Iran and made a conscious effort to display his disdain for the fatwa and tobacco ban. This move caused him to lose popularity among the masses. However, over the years, he emerged as one of the leading figures in the fight against Mosafar al-Din Shah's regime. Bey Bahani's involvement in the anti-monarchy movement dated back to 1905, when a photograph of Joseph Naus at a masquerade ball dressed as a religious clergyman was leaked. Bey Bahani was enraged by this act and used the picture in his religious sermons, calling for Naus's dismissal. When Mosafar al-Din Shah refused to take action, Bey Bahani became a fierce opponent of his court. Although he did not necessarily agree with all the demands of the protesters, and in some case, he opposed their beliefs as he saw them as against the values of Islam, he became one of the most prominent figures in the fight against the power of the court during this period. After earning a lot of goodwill from his support of the tobacco deal, Bey Bahani wrote a letter to the British ambassador requesting that the people be allowed to use the embassy as a sanctuary for their strikes and protests. The British government initially rejected the request, but after a second request was made by the clergy and other prominent figures, the embassy finally allowed the protesters to take shelter in the outside vicinity of their state on July 19, 1906. The next day, over 50 people came to the embassy and sat there in protest. The day after, even more people showed up, and each day, the number of protesters increased substantially. Soon, a community was shaped within the walls of the embassy, with numbers reaching above 14,000. They would hold talks and discussions about the European political systems, learn about the constitutional governments across the world, and discuss how Persia could benefit from having its own parliament, overseeing the orders of the Shah and keeping him in check. Ever since the revolution of 1688, the British people had put on significant limitations on their monarchy, 
and gave Parliament more power in deciding the path for the country. This made their embassy a safe haven for the protesters. The British were in the same boat as them, they had the same ideals, and they had fought for what the Persians were fighting for. Within the walls of the British embassy, the constitutional fighters felt more at home than in their own country. For the British government, this was the perfect opportunity to gain back the trust of the Iranian people. They saw the shift towards centralized government in Persia as inevitable, and by gaining the trust of the people, they were setting themselves up for victory over the Russians in the long run. The organization of these protests and strikes were a massive undertaking, with camps set up all over the outdoor area of the embassy, each union having its designated space. The protests were managed by the heads of the union who allocated space to newcomers, implemented rules to maintain order and prevent chaos, and ensured that protest funds, donated by powerful merchants, were used efficiently. A mutual ground was established with pots full of stews and soups brewing so that the residents would not go hungry, and resources were allocated to keep the protesters satisfied throughout the duration of the protests. It is worth noting, however, that during this period, women were prohibited from participating in these events, and they were not even allowed inside the British Embassy. What happened during the summer of 1906 was truly magical. Iranian people, tired of the monarchy's selfish rule and Persia's declining economical conditions, came together in this grand and extensive show of discontent. For three weeks, the protesters lived in the same camp ate together and talked about the most important issues that were on their minds, and from this discourse, their demands went beyond anything they could ever dream of. By the end of June, Mosafar al-Din Shah, fearing the persisting strikes, gave up the fight and agreed to the original demands of the protesters once more. But these demands were no longer enough. The British Embassy's protests, which took place between July 20th and August 11th, resulted in a significant shift in people's demands. Instead of a vague house of justice with unclear functionality and minor reforms, the protesters sought a more substantial change, the establishment of a parliament where individuals from various fields of life could come together, discuss issues, and create laws that would benefit the common people. This assembly was to be called the Majlis, and it became a crucial demand for those fighting against the monarchy. The protests represented a turning point in Iranian history, marking the beginning of a movement towards the democratic values and a departure from the traditional autocratic system. Resistance was futile. Shah had no choice but to cave in. On August 5, 1906, Mosafar al-Din Shah gave out the order for the establishment of the National Consultative Assembly. A committee consisting of politicians, nobles, merchants, and religious figures was formed to devise the general rules of the parliament and the election process of its members. The parliament was to have 156 members, with 60 of them selected from Tehran and the rest from other regions of the country. The members of the parliament were to be selected from different classes of society with royals, nobility, Shiite clergy, merchants, unions, and landowners each having their own seats. The parliament would start its work once the members from Tehran were selected and would gradually fill the other seats as the other regions went through their elections. Finally, after months of conversation, negotiations, and protests, on October 7, 1906, the first National Consultative Assembly of Persia opened its doors and began its work. Persia finally had a parliament of its own. For Iranians, the parliament was just the beginning. Now that the working class had a voice of their own and had the power to implement change, they wanted to rewrite the constitution and limit the power of the Qajar court. But with a sick Shah on his dying bed, and an heir who was a fierce enemy of democracy, the opportunity for change was running out. In the next episode of The Lion and the Sun, we talk about the attempts to change the Persian constitution 
and how the successor to Mosafar was bent on destroying the progress Iranians had made. Thank you for joining me on this episode of The Lion and the Sun. To learn more about the events and people mentioned in this episode, please visit our website at thelionandthesun.org or follow us on Instagram and Twitter. If you like this episode and our show so far, don't forget to rate the podcast and leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to us from. Your feedback will help us to improve and bring you even more engaging content in the future. We look forward to continuing this journey with you and exploring the rich history of Iran together. My name is Oriana, and I'll see you in two weeks. Thanks for listening.